Next up is uh, Jen Buchanan with Tip of the Mint Watershed Council. She's the Associate Director and she has been working with the Watershed Council since 2004. And her main work, you know, focuses on the water, you know, as part of the watershed protection team. And she has been working on natural shoreline and stream bank restoration efforts um, for quite a while. And she has a master's of landscape architecture from the Ohio State University. And Jen has been an integral part in helping us create a lot of information and tools for the natural shoreline partnership. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen. Okay, can uh, can you hear me and see me? Everything yes. looks good. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, welcome everybody and thank you um, for inviting the Watershed Council to participate today and the organizers of the Shoreline and Cellos Conference. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. And uh, thank you for, uh, or to those of you who are uh, here for this last segment. So um, I just wanna give you a little bit of an overview of the Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council. We're an environmental nonprofit in Northern Michigan. Our organization was formed in 1979. And we currently have a staff of 12 our staff work at the local, state, and federal levels, and we're grateful for the support of our uh, over 2,700 members who help us accomplish the important work of protecting water resources in Northern Michigan. And the map there shows our service area, but again, we also work at the state and federal level as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about shoreline bioengineering. Uh, the Watershed Council has a long history of bioengineering dating back to the 1990s uh, when staff member Doug Fuller recognized the need to promote natural shorelines and discovered that bioengineering offered the benefits of shoreline restoration and lake protection. He developed the guidebook, Understanding, Living With and Controlling Shoreline Erosion and um, that continues today to help guide shoreline property owners and contractors and others in understanding lake and land processes um, that impact shorelines while providing direction on how to restore shorelines utilizing what we consider bioengineering practices. The book is available. Uh, for download on our website at www.watershedcouncil.org um, and you can click on resources and then go to publications download library and you can search, your, search for it there. So and there are also many other publications and videos available at that location. So I encourage you to check them out as well. I also point out the photo shown on the left is our first bioengineering project on Crooked Lake in Emmett County, Michigan. Immediately after installation, and here it is today, it has grown in. So it uh, proof that bioengineering does work on high energy lakes. So bioengineering um, is also known among, or, a, a, a number of different terms, including natural lakescaping, living shorelines, biotechnical erosion control, soft engineering, to name a few. So regardless of the term, though, the principle is the same, to restore shoreline function and protect lake health by recreating the natural environment, natural shoreline environment. This includes using plantings, soils, biodegradable materials, and in some cases, Fieldstone. It is not constructing seawalls and other vertical hardened structures that are neither good for the lake nor good for the shoreline dependent species that rely, that rely upon natural shorelines. A very important aspect of bioengineering is there is not a one size fits all. 
solution. Bioengineering must take into consideration site-specific conditions, and perhaps the most important consideration is wave energy, which you heard excellent presentation from Brian earlier. So here you can see what is known as the bioengineering continuum. As lake energy increases at a given site, the bioengineering solution must respond accordingly. You can see on the far left, where a given shoreline may be subject to less energy, oftentimes simply refraining from mowing to the water's edge is all that is necessary to restore shoreline function and stabilize erosion. As energy advances, installation of more deep rooting plants will be necessary. At a location with more energy and erosion, the integration of coir logs, which I will discuss, is needed. And on high energy lakes, like we have in Northern Michigan, a combination of plantings, coir logs, and light riprap or fieldstone is often needed to achieve stabilization. So shoreline buffers. The most important component of any shoreline project is a robust buffer of native vegetation. Known as shoreline buffers or green belts, these plants are critical to shoreline resiliency against waves, wind, and ice. They filter pollutants from entering the lake and provide critical habitat. Their benefits cannot be underestimated. Native plants, particularly woody shrubs and prairie plants like big and little blue stem and black-eyed Susans, have deep fibrous root systems that bind the soil together. These root systems also intercept and infiltrate runoff that includes pollutants like sediments and nutrients. The diagram shown uh, shows side-by-side -side comparison of root systems of native species and non-native species. You can see the native plant roots extend two and a half meters or more, whereas non-native plant species extend less than one meter. So preserving native vegetation along the shoreline is the best approach any shoreline property owner can take. But if this vegetation has already been removed, um, then restoring this vegetation is the next best thing. The Watershed Council has worked with many, many watershed stakeholders to incentivize greenbelt restoration through hands-on workshops, cost share programs, and technical assistance Providing these opportunities among lakefront property owners is critical to protecting and restoring water quality. These photos show some of our work, including a hands-on greenbelt restoration workshop on Mullet Lake in Sheboygan County, a no-mo zone at the upper right, a part of a shoreline demonstration project, slightly, uh, a slightly more ornamental shoreline restoration project on Intermediate Lake, in Antrim County on the bottom left. And full disclosure, a great little video that features my son from about seven years ago that I encourage you to check out. He does know what he's talking about. I will also mention there are numerous other Shoreline Project videos on the Watershed Council's YouTube channel. And we're adding more all the time. So I'm gonna get into some of the techniques now I'm going to start with live stakes. Continuing with uh, shoreline planting techniques, not just for low energy sites, but all energy sites. Um, live stakes are basically cuttings from shrub species like willows, red osier dogwood, nine bark button bush, and other common shoreline plants that tend to be multi stem. Stems from live. Uh, but dormant plants are cut from the shrub and installed into the ground. Within a growing season, these sticks, basically sticks, will form roots, begin to leaf out, and eventually develop into shrubs. The photo on the right is a collection of stakes cut from willows and other species prior to being installed into the ground. And the photo on the left shows a live stake that has begun to develop lateral branches. So uh, while it seems a bit hard to believe these really do work and here are the basic steps. So you can take a cutting uh, from a live shrub again, while dormant. 
And the illustration shows um, cutting basically a one to one and a half foot length, uh, but you can go longer. In fact, um, from my experience, I would encourage a length closer to three feet. Cut at a 45 degree angle at the bottom and blunt at the top and remove any lateral branches. You can use a piece of rebar then to create a pilot hole in the ground and install one stake per pilot hole while the angle, uh, putting the angled portion into the ground and be sure to uh, basically bury about half to two thirds of the overall stick, stake into the ground. Tamp the soil around the stake um, and then basically wait. Uh, the process is best done in the spring before leaf out. Here in Northern Michigan, now is the time when the window is closing within a few weeks. So this is a inexpensive and highly effective way to create and restore shorelines using native shrubs available um, in the landscape. Couple photos here of some live stakes being installed. In the upper left, some stakes um, being integrated into a relatively steep slope. You can see, again, look like basically just sticks being um, buried at a, you know, kind of an irregular pattern. Um, the bottom left photo shows them about um, within the same growing season. So they've uh, taken off and begun to leaf out and create some lateral branches. And on the right-hand side, similarly, that shrub, again, once was a basically a stick, is now um, on its way to becoming a full shrub. Okay, okay, so moving a little further along the spectrum of the um, high and low to high energy, let's talk about coir logs a little bit. First of all, what is coir? I get asked that a lot. Coir is basically the husk fibers from coconuts. Uh, you may in fact even have a coir doormat at your front door. Um, coir logs are also known as bio logs and they are used in the erosion control industry for a variety of purposes. Um, but for shorelines where conditions are right, they're an important part of restoration. Uh, they are cylindrical structures encased in a biodegradable mesh, and they are typically come in a 12, 16, or 20 inch diameter. And their lengths are typically about 10 feet in length. Here are two projects under construction uh, that the Watershed Council worked on. One, on the left-hand side, it's Elk Lake. And on the right-hand side, that is Walloon Lake. Both high energy systems. So hence the field stone uh, that is shown, which I will discuss shortly. For low to medium energy locations or sites. Coir logs, along with plantings, both landward and lakeward of the coir log may be all that is necessary to stabilize and restore a shoreline. The diagram shows a coir log staked in place at the toe of a slope. Note the ordinary high water mark, OHWM, meets the coir log about midway. In this case, the coir log has an herbaceous plug, basically a tiny plant uh, embedded in it. Um, and with enough moisture, these plants will thrive. Core logs do degrade over time, uh, but it usually takes about seven to 10 years. So as the core log is degrading, the plants planted into it and immediately behind it will start to fill in. The photo at the right shows a newly installed coir log with plantings immediately behind it. Those plantings are planted directly into a biodegradable erosion control blanket. Okay, so when coir logs alone aren't enough, so for higher energy lakes, like here in Northern Michigan, <clears throat> where fetch can extend up to 11 miles in the case of Torch Lake, shoreline restoration needs a little more than coir logs and plantings. Time and time again, I have heard contractors 
and shoreline property owners alike tell me that big boulders are the only thing that will hold a shoreline in place. But over decades of designing and installing bioengineered shorelines with smaller field stone, we know that simply isn't true. So this illustration shows a typical cross section of bioengineered shoreline that includes coir logs, field stone, and plantings. The key components to this design, which are essential for any high energy inland lake shoreline project are slope, toe stone, rock size, rock composition, coir elevation, filter layer, and native plants. So slope, as you can see noted on the diagram, and as Brian mentioned earlier, the flatter the slope, the better. So this shows a, basically a minimum of four on one. Three on one will work, but anything exceeding that slope um, is discouraged. So four on one is what we usually aim for. You can also notice the toe stone at the base of the slope is generally the largest stone of the entire structure and that helps basically hold the wedge of rock in place. And it's typically a stone that is angled in, in its arrangement and somewhat buried within the substrate of the lake bottom. The rock size, which I'll talk about on how to size different rocks, is imp a very important aspect of this overall structure. And the rock composition as well, it isn't um, all stones should be equal in size. It needs to be a variable size configuration. Um, another thing is the elevation of the coir log. Um, earlier I showed coir log without field stone and the ordinary high water mark should meet about midway of the coir log. And then the base layer is what we call the filter layer, which is a substitute for um, what some contractors prefer to use as a geotextile fabric. Um, but we have found over the years that a combination of field um, Drain stone and pea gravel serves this function much better, um, prevents soil from being removed through erosion, through waves that come through any voids, but also allows plant materials to grow up through it. And of course, native plants, as I've emphasized from the beginning, that is the key component of any successful shoreline project. This slide uh, I've used for a number of years and it features something that I think is uh, key to a successful bioengineering project with field stone, which is careful attention to positioning of the field stone. Uh, these two contractors are on their hands and knees uh, positioning rocks um, to get it just right. So you might get lucky and have a contractor who will quite literally dump rock along the shoreline. Um, or if you're a do-it-yourselfer. Um, but layering and basically knitting in some of these field stones um, so that you create, um, it isn't a wall necessarily, but a uniform slope of rock with minimizing the amount of voids in between is really key. So again, going back to what contractors and property owners tell me regularly about is, uh, you know, how do you, how do you determine what the appropriate rock size for any given site is? And there is actually some science and a formula behind how we determine that. So how do you know what is too big or too small? So first um, you need to know the fetch. And I know Brian talked about that earlier. Fetch again is the open water distance that wind can travel across the lake to your site. And I do use Google Earth to measure that distance. Uh, next, you need to know what is considered the average sustained over water wind speed, which sounds a little more complicated perhaps than it is. Uh, here in Northern Michigan, we have determined that 35 miles per hour is appropriate. 
So taken together, as shown in the table, you can determine the significant wave height. I've highlighted the column for 35 miles per hour. And you can also see on the left-hand side, as fetch increases, the significant wave height also increases. So that's a good starting point. So again, um, all of this information is detailed in the Watershed Council's Understanding Living With and Controlling Shoreline Erosion. Um, so you uh, please refer to that for more information, but um, just as a general overview, once again, um, determining rock size, uh, the, this table is included in the book. And um, again, using the significant wave height, as we determined on the last slide, you can determine what we consider the median or the average rock diameter needed for your project. So you can see as significant wave height increases, so too does the average rock diameter, which stands to reason. And remember, any successful bioengineering project incorporates a range of rock sizes. You don't want everything to be uniform in size. So this table does show the median or average, but you also have to know the largest and the smallest rock size that you're gonna be incorporating into your project. So to, to determine the maximum size, you take the median and you multiply by one and a half. And to determine the smallest, you multiply by 0.5. And so as an overall volume of the rocks that you're gonna need, you're gonna want about 50% of the composition to be of that um, median rock size, 25% of, of the largest and 25% of the smallest rock sizes. So here's a photo of a recently installed project. Again, I wanna just point out a few things about how the smaller stones have been basically, they're basically top dressed to fill in the voids between some of the larger rocks that lie beneath. They're within basically the core of this structure. So um, key thing here is the slope is four on one. And you can see that this ice sheet as it's advancing shoreline is starting to break at the toe of the slope, which is key. If this were more vertical, the ice would have a greater tendency to basically push at that vertical nature of the shoreline and you might start to get more of that ice shove berm. So, um, also, I'd like to point out that organic debris that you can see starting to accumulate uh, that's being introduced from both the ice and the waves is going to help fill in a lot of those voids in between these smaller rocks, which is going to help create uh, an environment for plant materials to become established. So um, this project is well on its way, I believe, to becoming a what we would consider a restored shoreline. I'm going to now feature a few projects that the Watershed Council has done over the years. Um, so this project featured here, uh, down here in Indian River on Burt Lake in Sheboygan County, has a fetch of 6.6 .6 miles. And we determined, um, again, through that table I showed you, that the average significant wave height is 2.64 feet, again, that seems a little more precise, but um, it's a good kind of uh, target to shoot for. And so therefore the median rock diameter is just over 11 inches. The largest stone is over 16, and the smallest is around five and a half. I will point out this side has a lot of energy. And so those rocks are on the larger side of things, but it was warranted for this particular site. So despite having a reasonable green belt, uh, wave action was continually eroding the shoreline as you can see by the exposed roots on the left-hand side. The photo on the right shows how it was key for us to secure the coir log as close to the shoreline as possible without disturbing too many roots. And also that we um, 
made sure to backfill behind the coir log to provide more stability to it as well as to encourage more plants to grow lakeward. So again, that's kind of an under construction photo. Again, this is during installation. You can see we've um, staked the coir log and what you can see kind of in the foreground is that filter layer that I mentioned. So a combination of pea stone and drain stone is basically a course or a, a base for the coir log and extends slightly lakeward of the coir log. And what we do is we start filling in the field stone on top of that layer. Okay, and this features uh, the same site immediately after installation. The top of the coir log, which you can't really see there, is slightly exposed and, exposed and the field stone is at a really gentle slope, something that um, Brian emphasized earlier and, and I will as, again. You can see the toe stones, that base of that wedge of rock can be seen along the bottom edge and then again, the smaller stones have been top dressed to fill in the voids between the larger stones. And they're gonna to continue to settle over time through wave and ice action. Okay, so I had to throw in um, a slide here showcasing that bioengineering on high energy lakes doesn't always uh, turn out the way that you hoped. Um, so while I know this technique does definitely work, it is not always foolproof. So here's a photo of a project done um, by the Watershed Council years ago on Douglas Lake, again in Sheboygan County. You can see after one winter, the entire project was compromised due to a severe winter and a lot of ice push. We determined that when the project was completed in November, uh, the slope of the field stone was too steep for the site. It was somewhere between two on one and three on one, which just wasn't flat enough. So the project was rebuilt and the slope flattened to four on one or flatter and it has held up very nicely ever since. Another project of the Watershed Council on Intermediate Lake in Antrim County uh, supported through a grant to restore shorelines in Northern Michigan. Uh, dilapidated concrete seawalls, you can see in the upper left, um, was replaced with a bioengineered shoreline utilizing coir logs, plantings, and fieldstone. Uh, I'll also point out that the project was installed one November and the contractors were not very pleased to having had to place the toe stones by hand in the water that was a little chilly. Uh, here's the site a couple years later. Uh, you can see the dashed red line um, basically shows the approximate location of the coir log, although you can't see it at this point because it's grown in so nicely. Uh, the green belt comprised of native plants and their cultivars uh, has grown in very well. And the field, store, field stone has sorted itself um, through um, wave and ice action. And you can also note if it's possible, you can see that the wave energy uh, breaking at this shoreline, of course, is that much further out as opposed to the neighboring property with a concrete seawall where, again, it's hitting the seawall and creating bottom scour. Same location, uh, just pointing out here that the sand has accumulated into the rocks and has actually somewhat rebuilt a bit of a beach for the property owners. The green belt has grown in again very nicely and many of the plants that were installed have actually um, advanced lakeward. So they're going both further behind and in front of the coir log. So their property continues to erode 
unfortunately. So, um, or excuse me, the neighboring property here, you can see there's some remnant of uh, shoreline seawall, dilapidated concrete again. This property owner chose not to uh, restore their shoreline when this particular property did. And so uh, we hope eventually over time that this property owner will see the value in restoring their shoreline as well, since this looks terrific, has um, actually rebuilt a lot of the shoreline. Okay, another project uh, that we worked on is on Pickerel Lake in Emmett County at the uh, Camp Petasega, so a county park. Uh, this again was grant funded. We had the opportunity to restore about 80 some feet of shoreline. Uh, you know, they were mowing basically to the water's edge. You can see from these photos that there was some erosion. They were losing um, significant amount of frontage. And so uh, they were interested in, you know, doing a bioengineering project and we had the opportunity to use the site as a contractor training project um, and uh, had a lot of contractors uh, throughout the state attend um, and installed an incredible amount of work in uh, a few hours time, again, using the choir log and the field stone. So a few photos from that on um, that workshop that day. And along with that, the shoreline work with the coir log and the field stone, of course, we also made sure to have a lot of native plantings go in along the green belt. So um, we increased the diversity um, and you can see a lot of them incorporated into a shoreline erosion blanket. So here you can see, um, this is uh, this photo on the left, and it doesn't look very terrific right here, but just by, I wanted to make sure to include it for comparison's sake. You can see the coir log along here, an extent of field stone. We also used um, a deer exclosure fencing because of the degree and expense of the native plants that we included. And there was virtually no maintenance done immediately after installation. So we were lucky um, over time that a lot of those um, great native plants from wild type nursery took off uh, without a lot of attention. Uh, this photo on the right hand side, you can see the coir log with the blue arrow and then the water. So what has happened is the water level has advanced and come up quite a bit. But all of the plantings, um, there's been a lot of plants that have advanced, again, lakeward, and a lot of things that have basically volunteered into that shoreline buffer. And basically showing here what we've done, here is the um, coir log, hard to see, but this is about the location of the coir log. Here's that toe stone. And as you can see, we've basically rebuilt shoreline, which I think is about four to five feet at this point. So without a whole lot of maintenance whatsoever, uh, one of the key things I believe has been that the organic material that has accumulated because of the degree of fetch, that blows material um, toward the shoreline has been allowed to accumulate into the field stone and has rebuilt basically soil that has allowed plant materials to advance lakeward. And one more picture, this was from fall. Again, about the location of the coir and how much land basically we have built outward. The toe stone is just off the edge of that land mass. So uh, one more kind of area of technique that I just want to make sure that I highlight today are soil lifts. 
Uh, soil lifts are um, appropriate for medium to high energy sites. Um, there's also a similar technique that I'm a little more familiar with uh, that uses a proprietary product called BioD Block. And you can see uh, this, uh, you can see on this slide a demonstration project installed about 10 years ago at the Kellogg Biological Station. Soil lifts are basically compacted soil wrap, compacted soils wrapped in a, again, kind of a biodegradable blanket that provides structural support uh, to the shoreline and also incorporates shoreline plantings in between these layers. So you can see that. Um, Um, also, to, worth noting at this particular site, they incorporated some field stone at the toe of the slope. And you can see um, how this has grown in over a short period of time. So they go in looking one way and with a little bit of time and a little bit of nurturing, um, they go through a lot of stages and then end up looking pretty terrific in the end. Okay, so here you can see a cross section of um, just a general cross section of soil lifts. It's important to note here that soil lifts really do become or are important to establish above again that ordinary high water mark. And the base in this case um, below the ordinary high water mark is composed of cobble wrapped layers. So that's important to create a, basically a structural foundation for the soil laser layers and also that the cobbles, of course, can be more resilient against erosion under the ordinary high water line. And then I just want to feature a little bit here um, a project that I worked on. Um, uh, using bio D blocks so basically a variant of soil lifts. And uh, they are a trademark product of the company Rolanka. Uh, but because uh, they turned out to be so success successful, I wanted to certainly feature them today. This uh, project was on the Pigeon River, so not an inland lake. Um, but I believe the um, technique is certainly still very applicable to inland lakes as well. So they are pre-constructed product, much like soil lifts that are backfilled with compacted soils and um, basically layered in a vertical or approaching vertical arrangement. And they have a vertical face of coir fibers, much like coir logs, and a, an attached fabric, basically a woven mesh, biodegradable mesh that extends a distance uh, but behind the coir face, as shown in the right-hand diagram. So this is the before picture of this Pigeon River erosion site. You can see the bank is slumped significantly. The height was about eight feet and the slump extended you know, along the river about 10 feet. So the house, which you can barely see, uh, was about 20, maybe about 25 feet from the slump. So there was a certain sense of urgency to restore this stream bank. Here is a cross section provided on the left by Rolanka, just basically illustrating how their product can be used. And at the right, you can see that's my illustration that I used to basically inform the property owners what we were planning to do, as well as um, to obtain our permit from state agencies. The dotted line you can see here basically shows the profile of the slumped bank, the general configuration, and then also overlaying that, what we propose to do with the bio D block. So this was installed, I think, in about 2007, 2008. Uh, the contractors did all of the work by hand, amazingly. Here they are um, basically sending some down some of the field stone to, at the base 
Um, but they did have to excavate uh, to get the, uh, the depth that they needed to lay those um, layers of the bio D block. And once again, there's my son doing a site inspection. On the left-hand side, you can see this is immediately after installation. Uh, so some of these bare root shrubs, including nine mark and dogwood, I believe, have started to take root. Again, it's pretty steep, but that's what the site warranted. And again, I do think this is um, very applicable to both stream banks and inland lake shorelines. And on the right hand side, you can see this is about, I, I want to say about the spring following installation of that project. So uh, a lot of the plants certainly uh, overwintered just fine and are starting to get established. And while I recognize it's hard to see, if you look closely, you can see that these shrubs have really taken off. This is the following year. You can see at the core, um, that bio D block, the face of that, these shrubs are beginning to really take root and extend outward. And again, a little more zoomed in. So the resiliency of these shrubs, once again, um, is really something and um, demonstrates once again, that their usefulness in all kinds of applications and what they can achieve for both stream bank control and erosion control. And with that, I can take questions. Oh, oops. All right. Fab fabulous, Jen. Thank you for your presentation. There are a bunch of questions. Um, one, I actually answered um, in typing, but I wanted you to speak to it as well. Um, why uh, it was regarding filter fabric and why you didn't use the filter fabric. Yeah. Um, so. I yeah. mentioned that, you know, the reason for, for the plants and the undercutting of waste, but I was just wanted um, you to speak about that too. Sure. Yeah, um, filter fabric, um, you know, again, contractors um, love it and um, it really does perform a, a, a service, but I think um, what I described as our alternative to that is being that drain stone and pea gravel mix works um, better. So. The filter fabric prevents um, basically um, waves to remove soil particles from below the rock revetment. And so that is certainly an important aspect, but it invariably gets torn and shredded and unsightly. And it also more importantly prevents a lot of the native shrubs that I hope I was able to illustrate somewhat in some of those slides from basically getting a foothold and rooting into basically the rock revetment. That's ultimately what you want. So um, while it is serving one purpose, it's preventing, I think, a more important purpose of shoreline restoration. Okay, and I have a, uh one regarding the, the shrubs as well. A couple questions on um, uh, which ones work best for live stakes and which shrubs work best in, in, in general. Um, I will um, note there were a couple of questions regarding this, um, so I didn't want to type it in both, but uh, the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership has on our website a list of plants and they are organized by where these plants would work best. Um, so in, in some of those lists, um, there will be the, the shrubs that are noted. I will also note that um, in terms of what shrubs work best, look around. Um, so a northern shrub uh, that might be up north might be a little different down in, in the southern um, half of Michigan or depending on what your lake is as well. So with that, I will let Jen ans finish answering that. <laughs> Um, my experience, and I, I know because when I look at basically uh, vendors of live sticks, because you, you know, you can certainly collect them in the wild on your own, but there are also online companies that you can order them and have them shipped to your door. So the species that are offered are quite wide ranging. My experience um, with live sticks are red osier dogwoods, willows in general, and nine bark although I know it extends well beyond that. So, but um, those are kind of the, the three 
species that I've had the most success with and experience with in Northern Michigan. Okay. Let's see. Um, Oh, this is something we were just talking about too. How do you assess what is natural baseline erosion versus something that requires a project on a shoreline? (laughs) Good question. (laughs) I will say before, while Jen is like thinking about her answer, Jen and I have been talking about this and we're, um, we are working on a new document that um, really um, is more geared toward towards the homeowner and trying to address this a little bit, it might not be the perfect answer because there's a lot of depends and a lot of complex answers. Um, But hopefully by the end of this summer, we will have another document um, available. But so now I will let turn that over to Jen. You know, over the years, um, I think my thinking has changed a little bit about, you know, what is accelerated erosion and natural erosion. And um, of course, the property owner is, is, going to be, I think, a little more sensitive to what they consider to be accelerated erosion. So um, there isn't a really a benchmark to use to say, okay, this is, you've lost so many inches and so many, you know, months or years, unfortunately. Um, but you can have a, a dramatic event that basically where you lose a whole lot of shoreline in one episode, uh, but that still may be natural. So, um you know, when I see root exposure, but the plants are still surviving, um, I tend to think of that as more of a natural erosion process. Whereas when things get wiped out altogether, that's going to be what I would consider more accelerated. Um, But what I encourage property owners to do is um, basically put a stake in the ground, uh, a couple stakes maybe at different distances from the water's edge and monitor any potential shoreline loss over a period of time um, because it may not be as much loss as you think it is. And so if you can kind of um, measure that horizontal distance over time, it may seem uh, more dramatic than it actually is. So I I know that's not a great answer, And it also, I think, depends on a lot of the neighboring properties as well and what kind of um, experience they're happening. Um, So if it's gradual, it may tend to be more uniform. If it's accelerated, it may be due to a particular um, shoreline management practice or something like that. And you see suddenly a, a big loss isolated to a particular parcel. Right. Um, next question. Um, with regards to using a core log in between the rock and the land or in the native plantings, um, is it better to use that core log? What, what's the advantage of using that core log in between the rock and the land? So again, that choir log is going to give you kind of a temporary, you know, although temporary meaning like multiple years, um, opportunity to get plants fully established behind it. So without that in its absence, um, those plants that you're going to be working to get established are going to be that much more vulnerable behind that rock. Um, Because again, that wave energy is still going to be penetrating to some extent and undermining some of the soils. So, um, so it's, it is serves as a great buffer and uh, allows those plants to get established. And depending on basically the, the shoreline configuration, in some instances, it's just not appropriate to, to use because of, you know, it just won't quite fit into the landscape. So, um, but when I see, you know, accelerated erosion where there's a pretty steep profile of, of shoreline exposed, you know, it's almost always appropriate to use a coir log. And again, that's just to help, help protect the whole unit together. Right. Okay, I'm going to throw in a couple of questions that are kind of related. Um, for the Burt Lake project, I'm mm-hmm. um, looking at um, what was the estimated cost per foot and how was it funded? And then um, kind of associated with that, like estimated costs for associated from converting a failing seawall to a living shoreline or versus repairing a seawall. 
Terrific question, and I had a feeling that would come up. Um, the Burt Lake project was funded by the property owners, um, and that happened in like 2009, so hard to re quite remember. You know, we used to say rock, coir log, and a decent green belt was going to be about 100 bucks a linear foot. That number has gone way higher <laughs> at this point. So, um, you know, it's too, in factor costs seem to really depend upon accessibility to a particular shoreline. If uh, vehicles can get um, near the shoreline to deposit materials, costs are gonna be lower. But if there has to be a lot of, you know, hand carts and things like that, costs are gonna go way up. So. Um, you know, it's easily two, three, maybe even $500 a linear foot, basically, to do um, coir log with field stone and a decent green belt plantings. So I, I'm, I'm always surprised at the numbers that I see. Um, what was the other part of that question? Um, kind of looking at replacing oh. a, a failing seawall versus repairing a seawall, a failing one. That is a good question as well. I think it depends on the construction of the seawall. Um, I think one of my first slides showed a seawall where I put the little band sign over. Um, you know, they had maybe 80 to 100 feet of uh, seawall and they had it replaced to their credit um, with a natural shoreline using coir log and, and, and field stone. And I know that was, you know, about $100,000 and so that was removing the seawall and replacing it. So I can't really speak to comparing, restoring or replacing a seawall um, versus basically a wholesale restoration of a site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna just um, add on to that. You know, you might have picked up on a word that Jen was use has been using and the word is depends. And <laughs> Um, and that's kind of like something that we talk about here within the Shoreline Partnership and, and the people doing the work. It's, there is a lot of depends. It depends on site characteristics so much, depends on the lake. It depends on where you are on the lake. Um, it just depends on what Jen said on site accessibility. It depends on the length of the, of the site as well. Um, so it's really about going out and looking at the site and doing a full assessment and, and recognizing that there's just a lot of complex um, factors that come together to create a system. And it, it's not a one size fits all. Uh, but bottom line is what we're trying to do, you know, people say it's like, well, I'm just going to go with a, with a seawall. Bottom line, what we're trying to do is about the lake and we're trying to build resiliency back into the lake shores for longer term solutions, not just for the landowner and the property, but looking at it from the lake perspective. How can we better protect that lake from a long term perspective? And, and this is really what it's about. So and if there is practical and feasible alternatives, then we highly recommend going that route. And uh, I will add, I will have uh, property owners say, okay, so I got an estimate for a shoreline project um, from somebody who, you know, has some experience with bioengineering, and it was five times as much as another guy who, you know, just in, has, is, you know, no offense, but is going to dump some rock. So, um it's not, you have to be careful to compare apples to apples. And so, um, and that's not easy because of course these things are um, very pricey and expensive and nobody wants to spend more than they have to, but it, it is worth considering what you're getting, what kind of estimates you're getting, what kind of work you can anticipate from these individual contractors. Okay. Here's one um, regarding ice um, for, and particularly on these high energy lakes, and it's um, wouldn't necessarily just be on high energy lakes too, but um, regarding that ice ridge, when you're working on restoration, is it best to uh, leave that ice ridge there or regrade it? And I'm gonna also throw in that word depends, but I'll let you answer. <laughs> 
Well, it depends. Um, <laughs> that is a good question. Um, we, the Watershed Council has, you know, always kind of encouraged folks to leave ice bridges and kind of work around them as best as possible because um, over time, as they form, they're creating a certain degree of resiliency against shoreline erosion as well. So when you end up flattening them, you kind of somewhat destabilize some of those shoreline conditions as well. So I try to encourage property owners, can you live with it? Can you, do you just can't live with it? If you can't live with it and you really feel like you need to flatten it, what are you going to do to compensate for that structural um, element that you're potentially losing? So then, then you really need to focus in on restoring some deep rooting shrubs and plants like that to kind of make up for what you may lose through flattening ice sperm. Yeah, um, I'm going to add in also that you know, Jen noted earlier in this presentation that plants are really a critical piece. And a lot of times people think that they need seawalls because they're seeing erosion, but really what's happening is that there's lawn up to the edge. And it's really about that the waves get underneath the lawn, the, the lawn roots, which are only three feet deep or three inches deep, about three to four inches deep. And so the waves go up underneath the, that lawn roots and then the bank slump. It was really critical that there are trees, shrubs, and native roots there that are holding that in place because they are more resilient to that wave energy. Um, and regarding that, the ice too, is they're more, particularly the shrubs, they are more resilient against the, the ice push because of the structure that they provide and they, they help weaken that ice as it moves up towards that, that shoreline. And Jen was talking about the slope and Brian was talking about slopes too. A gentle slope is incredibly important for dealing with ice because it creates ramps that ice runs up. Ice is very strong when it's moving uh, horizontally and it keeps pushing horizontally. It's very strong. If you create a ramp and let that, that run up, particularly as why Jen is, is important that um, that four on one slope at a minimum really um, is important uh, to allow that ice to run up, to allow these, these natural shorelines to be more resilient against that. I'm gonna go with the next one is, um, what is typically the depth of the P-stone, um, that filter stone that you typically use in, as the alternative to geotextile? Yeah, good question. I should have mentioned that. So um, it somewhat varies. If I have to, um, or the property owner needs to somewhat elevate, maybe a little bit, adjust the, uh, the coir log, the position, we'll put a few more inches underneath it. Um, but in general, like three, four inches, but you know, I might go as, as deep as six inches if I just need to get that uh, coir log up to the elevation to match that midpoint of the ordinary high water mark. So, um, and then it's somewhat, it tapers. So it's thickest right immediately below the um, coir log and then it, it tapers, kind of fans out. And then again, that, that the larger field stone is, uh, is laid on top of that. Okay. Um, so, okay, let's skip to one about um, Elk Lake and Lake Charlevoix. Um, do you see any difference between the effectiveness of bioengineering on more of like a, a dam controlled um, lake like Elk Lake or Lake Charlevoix where you're going to have more significant um, fluctuation of water levels? Well, it's certainly more predictable where you're going to have to set the elevation of the coir log. Um, so with Lake Charlevoix and its connectivity to Lake Michigan, yeah, you kind of have to, <laughs> the way things are going. You have to really try to um, do some speculation where that coir log is best going to be positioned. So, um, but if it's a lake controlled or, or yeah, level controlled lake, then, um, you know, we definitely aim to kind of, you know, find that elevation that's appropriate to, the to that lake for the coir log. So 
effectiveness overall, no. I think it's just, again, it's going to be site specific. And then, yeah, if there's a connectivity to the Great Lakes, definitely taking it, that into consideration and, and speculating. We have the project in Lake Charlevoix we're going to be working on uh, later this summer. And, you know, the Coyer log is going to have to be positioned um, according to, you know, lake levels right now. But um, over time, when those lake levels drop, that quarry log may end up looking a little high and dry, but hopefully all the plants will colonize, you know, lakeward and landward of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will add that, you know, as Brian talked about is really you got to go out and look at the entire system as a whole and like what kind of a lake you have. Um, is it dam controlled or, you know, or do you have significant lake level um, fluctuations and bottom line is these systems, these designs that are used, um, you know, more experience over time is needed and these are designed to be resilient. And I will ask, add as what, well, you know, Brian talked about um, in his presentation up on the, um, the Leland All Point on Lake Michigan is Lake Michigan levels um, go up and down over time. And the, the site where Brian talked about is it's still um, stable. Does it change over time? Absolutely. It changes just as normal any kind of lake system changes, um, but it's still resilient. And the goal is to create resiliency in these systems. And part of that is designing with the appropriate materials, um, sloping appropriately based on site characteristics, lake characteristics, and the plants are, are incredibly important um, component of this. And, and being able to understand that over a period of time, it's going to look different. And, it, you know, that's part of the resiliency. So when it goes in as a newly installed, um, will, it will not look like that for very long. And so it will go through a, a phases as water levels change and things like that. So um, people tend to want to have a, a very static looking shoreline and, and um, that's really not what it's about. So understanding that there's going to be some changes. Yeah, um, I also see uh, quite a few questions and uh, answer this one about where can people get a, a good list of contractors and instead of me like answering it a ton of times uh, on the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnerships website, we do maintain a list of contractors that have gone through our certified natural shoreline professional. Now with that said, um, it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. We do have gaps across the state where we um, don't do not have contractors that work in certain areas. Um, there are some contractors that do work statewide, those um, some challenges, it's, you know, obviously, it's going to cost a little bit more um, to bring somebody from southern Michigan up to northern Michigan. And there's varying degrees of experience as well. And we can't, you know, we don't recommend anything. You know, some there's landscaping firms. Uh, some of firms work more from the water's edge up on, on land. Some work right at the water's edge. There's engineering firms as well. Uh, so really it comes down to contacting more than one, um, usually three if you can, and um, see which one fits best for you. And it's also read through a lot of our information on the Shoreline Partnership and get more familiar with terms and concepts so that you can have that better, a conversation better with your, with a contractor so that you know that this contractor is um, knowledgeable and is going to be the right fit for you. Also, if you have a contractor that ever tells you that um, if there's construction at the shoreline and you don't need a permit, then I will say do not go with that, that contractor because permits are pretty much always required. Um, so with that, um, I just wanted to make that plug there. Um, so, uh, hold on a second. Oh, just a real quick one. How long does a deer fence need to be in place? Do you need to? That's a good question. Uh, the, the one that we had installed at uh, Pickerel Lake was up way longer than it needed to be because I think it was forgotten about, but um, 
project went in in June or July, could have come out in the fall. And I think it stood up there until spring. So, um, so, you know, a, a handful of months, I think is appropriate. Yeah, t typically, you know, enough to get the plants established um, and growing really well. Um, what about working on um, in the lakes that might have more of a murky bottom, like one to two feet out from shore, like ha working on successful installations with regards to those? Uh, there have been some challenges. Um, uh, work at, where it's a real mucky substrate and basically the, the, the field stone uh, needs more of a, a base basically or otherwise it keeps sinking in. So again, some of that filter layer, that pea gravel and drain stone does help to create a, a solid foundation or more so a, a degree of support for that field stone. Um, I do know that there have been other projects where they use uh, like an engineered product, uh, like a plastic geo grid um, along the substrate to basically reinforce the foundation and then put the field stone on top of that. I don't have experience with that, but I do know that that has been applied where substrate will not support basically that field stone. Okay, well, thanks. Um, we are out of time. And I know that there are other questions that need to be answered and we will do our best to follow up with them and provide. And again, I will say we will be providing more of our, our contact information. We'll be providing the links resources that we've been providing in the uh, chat room or chat session. And our, I think I said our contact information. And uh, I will say is um, I really appreciate people that have participated in um, both the Michigan National Shoreline Partnerships website and the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership website have a have numerous resources for homeowners and contractors to educate themselves, to share with their lake shore uh, lake property owners um, from the shoreline partnerships. We created a lot of information specifically for lake residents to share. So please check out those resources. Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council has a ton of resources as well. Uh, so a lot of information is there. It's just, you know, takes a little time and I appreciate um, everybody's participation. Um, we'll look forward to another great session uh, next year or with our In the Lake Convention next year. Thank you, everybody.